What you're about to see was thought to be impossible for hundreds of years. The process of converting spider silk into thread is so complex and so cumbersome, it's only been accomplished twice. Once in the year 1900, and sadly that fabric is lost, and more recently in Madagascar by Simon Piers and Nicholas Godley. Now, spider silk may have incredible tensile strength, but when it's turned into fabric, it doesn't react well to heat or moisture. As you can imagine, great care is taken for such a one-of-a-kind unique artifact, and only two people in the world have been allowed to wear the cape as part of a photo shoot, more recently, Stacy McKenzie at the Royal Ontario Museum. What you're about to see is a conversation that happens in the dark, partly because I didn't want to use any hot lamps against this remarkable material, partly because I did want you to see how it is illuminated and glows in the dark, and partly because this is, after all, an exhibit about spiders. Well, I'm here with Doug Curie of the Royal Ontario Museum, and I am really excited. I, I am really surprised. I did not expect to be able to see this incredible artifact here. I've, I've read about it for years, and I thought I would have to go to Madagascar to be able to see it. Uh, I'm so very thankful that uh, here it is coming to me here in Toronto. So thanks for having it here, Doug. Absolutely. This is one of the stars of the show, and uh, only the second time it's ever been shown. So uh, originally at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and we were very fortunate to be able to have it here as one of the jewels of our exhibit. Oh, it's amazing how you often get your hands on exhibits that you expect other uh, major locations in the United States to get it, but no, you get it on your hands first. Well done. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the ROM does have the three domains of art, culture, and nature. And, uh, of course, we like to highlight the art and, and culture art as well. And I think this is a eminently suitable object, uh, certainly stunning. It's an artifact that really does talk to different interests. I mean, I'm not exactly known as a fashion journalist, so you know there's more than meets the eye here. Uh, we are talking about a cape. It's a very special cape in terms of the material that it's made of. Can you help explain uh, why I'm so excited about this? Well, it's uh, certainly unusual. This is actually the product of uh, 1.2 million uh, golden orb web spiders from Madagascar. So it took over three years to produce and uh, wow. to get extract the threads, uh, weave it into workable threads, and then transform it into this amazing object. So what we're looking at here is actually spider silk. This is absolutely spider silk, and this is absolutely the natural color. So in uh, the golden orb weavers have uh, carotenoids and other sort of uh, pigments, natural occurring pigments in their silk. Uh, so this is not at all embellished. This is absolutely what what you see. And this was a, a team in Madagascar that had simply set up to the goal of saying, can we take silk from spiders? The same way we take silk from uh, silk moth caterpillars, for example, and make silk out of it. They were trying to do that with spider silk. It wasn't necessarily their knowledge or intention of, of creating a golden, beautiful piece of fabric. That's just the result that happened, I understand. The result that happened, but, uh, and what a result it is. But uh, uh, they, they were definitely determined to, to take that three years. The, the idea is not just to create a fashion cape of the modern age, but to evoke, I guess, some of the fashion and textile history that we've seen in the past. This is speaking to the history of a couple of hundreds of years of trying to create fabric out of silk. Yeah, I think it was something that had been attempted uh, uh, centuries ago, and uh, they were inspired to recreate it. And, uh, they had to very cleverly devise harnesses to put the spiders in and, and uh, look back at the old notes. And, uh, but uh, it certainly, I don't think it's something that's going to replace the, uh, the silk the conventional silk industry. Yeah, that's been the real trick. I mean, we've had silk from silkworms going back, I don't know, a thousand years. But for some reason, all the people who've tried to do this with spiders, it's proven to be a lot more trickier. So this is something that is the modern sort of solution. But as you mentioned, people have been trying to do this for 500 years and have been sort of failing in various ways. I mean, it's, it's quite an astonishing achievement here. Absolutely. And when I called it an artifact, I really do speak to that because this is the only one, and it's unlikely that there's going to be another one, right? I think with the amount of effort required, <laughs> it's not likely you're going to see these coming be able to buy off the rack for sure. There is a, a shawl uh, that was made out of silk as well, but this is by far the largest textile uh, made in this fashion. And this was a project done in 2004. There's been a lot of time passed. They haven't exactly. Uh, 
made any other additional fabric because that sort of speaks to just how difficult it was. Uh, you mentioned how many spiders? 1.2 1. 1. 1. million spiders. 1.2 million. And that was, uh, my understanding, they had to reach out to the local villagers to be able to try to collect these spiders. There were thousands of spiders that had to be submitted every day. That's right. One of the, the cool things I saw online in terms of talking about this project was that you would have some of the local youth and the kids even getting involved. It made me think of back to, to being a child and going off and searching for empty bottles to get the deposit, rushing in to get your money and to go off and get your candy. And there were lots of young uh, villagers that were showing up at their front doors, not just off, often with containers, but sometimes just like this. They had sort of reached and grabbed and they had the spiders carried in their hands to come and try to collect them. The matter is that very few spiders uh, are even capable of piercing human skin. Uh, and even fewer are dangerously venomous to, to humans as they do by two. So I think uh, the children of Madagascar are probably very well aware that the spiders are completely harmless to them and, uh, and are able to gather them in their hands. Yeah, it's, it's a remarkable thing to just contemplate. I would have loved to have been there watching these kids run off into the bushes and coming back with these spiders in their hands. The uh, Madagascan golden orb weaver spider, uh, I mean, you see a, a, a garment like this, it's beautiful, the color of the thread, natural as you mentioned. Often in nature, you know, the most beautiful songs and the most beautiful uh, spider, uh, the most beautiful result and products aren't necessarily from the most beautiful creatures. And yet in this case, the golden orb spider uh, weaver is a beautiful, stunning uh, creature to, to behold and take a look at. It is absolutely beautiful. Uh, members of the same genus occur throughout the world, but they, certainly the one from Madagascar is extra large and, and uh, certainly spectacular. I mean, it's called the golden orb weaver, and yet it's produced a golden fabric. And again, this is not something that we've had any hand in. This is just sort of a natural product of it. It is remarkable to me that we have tried so hard to make use of spider silk, and it just seems to evade our engineering, evade our technology. I know that uh, the Aboriginals in Australia use spider silk as uh, sort of fishing, uh, so things like that. But we've yet to really sort of figure out uh, what the, the potential uses are, and I guess a project like this does speak to that research as well. Absolutely, and our spider silk is ex extraordinarily strong, stronger than structural steel. And it's yet to figure out how it is made. I would love to be able to, uh, to make it synthetically, uh, but I think the complexity of the spin of the spiders, the combination of the seven different silks that come out of it, uh, have so far evaded uh, engineering, uh, bioengineering techniques. So uh, maybe one day, but uh, as far as we know, it's still the, the best for many applications. It's often said that spider silk is stronger than Kevlar. Do you think this is bulletproof? Uh, I, I don't think this is bulletproof. I, I, would, I wouldn't want to test such a wonderful object as this <laughs> to find out. But um, I think there has been some suggestions that it could be woven into a fashion that would have an application for that. Often spiders include in their silk pheromones. So if a male spider goes towards a female spider's web and he's picking up her pheromones there, I would imagine there would be pheromones here on this, this fabric. I don't know if it's been tested uh, for such. Um, it's possible. It's possible. If we were to allow a golden orb weaver spider to enter into this cabinet, do you have any guess what the behavior might be? Would it respond? Would it react to this fabric? Or? I don't think it would respond in any particular way, uh, to be honest. I think they would uh, make themselves very comfortable in there. But, uh, it would make a lovely uh, display. It does. Well, to see one, yes, traipsing along. Uh, I don't know if it pulls up on the video, but there actually are embroidered into the fabric little spider designs, of course. Now, oh, it's such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful garment. <laughs> so amazing to behold, and, and again, the only one of its kind. When they were extracting the silk from the spider, though, it's important to note that the spiders weren't harmed. No, they, they certainly wasn't their intention to harm the spiders, so uh, they did have harnesses that they, they made that they could hold them in and uh, were able to draw the, the silk out. And I understand that after the spiders were milked for their silk that they were actually released back into the wild, so 
it's an inconvenience, but it certainly wasn't a case of, of harming the first fighters. No, and, and I think if they did harm them, they, they would have taken a lot more than three years to, to come to this result. And it is kind of like milking a cow, in that you know, the idea of forcing these spiders to, to, to get their silk, well, it's not quite like that. It's already the spider has a built up of silk material, and then it's just triggering it to kind of release, much like a cow. Correct. Releasing its sort of coaxed out. Yeah. Oh, it's quite beautiful. Uh, have you had any experience working with spider silk? Have you? I have not. I've, I've not had that pleasure, but uh, <laughs> maybe it, it's something that uh, would be fun to try. Now, the process, that I'm a, uh, mainly known as a technology expert, so I have a very keen expert uh, interest in terms of the various little gadgets and machines that have been invented over the years to try to extract silk or get it the way that this has. Uh, my understanding is it's, it's like a, a spinning machine in terms of once they hold the spider down. That this is a case where you've actually got a mechanism that are turning the wheel and slowly sort of grabbing on the, the silk. I think it's a very slow process and a very precise exacting process and, and I have to give them kudos for figuring out exactly how to do it. And yeah. It didn't harm them and they, and they got the result that, uh, that, they, that they have. Now there's no touching of the cape, only looking at the Royal Ontario Museum, but the few who've had the opportunity to hold the fabric in their hands report it is surprisingly, shockingly light, far lighter than you'd expect. My thanks to Doug Curie, Spider's Fear and Fascination is on until January 6, 2019.